In 2023, I was excited to be invited to speak at MICA's Day Celebrating Mining Innovators. Ahead is my talk where we speak about social innovation and how solution providers have a role to play in transforming mining from what it is to what it can be. Excellent. <laughs> so land acknowledgement. This is where I am based out of, which is Peterborough, Ontario. So we're owned and operated on the treaty and I'm trying to find it here, and treaty and traditional territory of the Michisag Anishinaabeg. We want to acknowledge their ancestors and future generations. So for me, I spend a lot of time in the social impact world. I spend a lot of time working with indigenous peoples. And I've always, they've always said, you know, put some meaning into your land acknowledgement. So that to me means that I help to you to understand what your social impact is going to be on indigenous people. So when we are looking at automation, when we're looking at digitalization, all of these things are very important, but it has an impact. And that's something that needs to be recognized and thought about as we're starting to roll out these technologies. So that's me. I'm in Australia. I'm sitting on Patty Hannon's lap. Those of you that are familiar with Australian mining know of Patty Hannon. I was taken in Kalgoorlie for at Diggers and Dealers back in 2018. And I'm dump, jumping off of the dump truck from um, the super pit. I've been in mining for about 15 years. I've always worked in the mining services sector. So I spent 10 years with SGS. Hi to my former colleagues. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, and I worked at the global and national level. So I worked in environmental sales at the national level. And then I moved on to global sales and market development for them. Um, I focus on strategy development. So what that means is I help you grow in a socially conscious way by building strategies that communicate your value proposition. So to the business case, that's an internal value proposition that you need to build. Externally, I work with service providers to do go-to-market strategy. So how do you scale? What is your market? If you want to enter a new sector, how do you do that? Who are our targets? What are we looking at? What, is, what makes you different is what I work in. And it's really an interesting job because you come out with a nice fun pitch deck that you can give everybody, but there's a lot of background information that goes with that. Furthermore, I also work on employee value propositions. So as a producer or proponent in my world, why are you attracting young talent? We talked a bit today about um, a, competing against Microsoft, that's important, right? If we're gonna compete against Microsoft for talent, we better have a really strong value proposition. And why, does employee, why do employees wanna come work for us? Because if the choice is there, they might choose Microsoft because tech has a nice clean image and unfortunately, mining does not. I'm not saying I'm anti-mining, by the way, just putting that out there. <laughs> I actually quite believe in it. Um, I give up back quite a bit to the industry. I am officially now on the Human Resources Development Committee of PDAC, which was a very exciting thing as a non-technical, non-HR person to join. I participate in their SIMU, which is Student Industry Mining Education Workshop. Um, and I also do a lot of talks like this um, to new professionals, young talent, uh, boardrooms on how to attract young talent, etc. So note on today's discussion. Social responsibility goes beyond what you do in your community. It's also the contract that you have with your employees, with your talent. So when you are building a social, when you're thinking about what does social responsibility mean to me, yes, it looks like what you do in your communities, absolutely. But talent today wants to work for an organization that is ethical, that um, understands what their commitment is to the environment, that has good governance. And so all of that needs to combine. In my world, owners and operators are proponents. Um, and service providers are the ones that provide those services to the mines. Just so that we are aware of the language that I'm using, nobody is getting confused. So let's talk about some industry trends. We're not producing enough. 
to put that out. We all know this. We have an issue with that. We have higher demand and not enough supply. It's unfortunately at this point getting worse and not better. That's why we're here today. So the deficit risks the move to net zero, and that's a key focus for millennial and Gen Zs. So again, going back to that social performance, how are you tying that together? How are you providing that value proposition that you get to work on really fun projects? You're, you're solving challenging, complex problems. You are working in communities that are accepting of your project, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a significant brain drain. Women, which we can't attract to the industry fast enough, are unfortunately leaving the industry as well. So with that goes a lot of talent and a lot of um, just that av availability of people that we can use and that we can tap into. Unfortunately, I found out that my local college, which does a geo uh, science technician program that gives direct entry to university, they've shut their program down. This program was industry recognized and that is just one example of how we're losing talent out of the industry. And young talent isn't choosing mining. We have a reputation issue. We need to work on that. I don't, th I don't think that's news to anybody. So saying that we need a more co cohesive value proposition as a mining sector is really challenging to say because it's you know, a global sector. How do you do that? Many organizations do not have an employee value proposition. You need to have one in order to attract your talent. It's a now a must have. And the onus is placed on the proponents. So our change is a cross sector change. It's not just a mining problem as far as proponents are concerned. It's all of us in this room. It's my problem, it's your problem, it's everybody's problem. And so we need to start working a little bit better together to start to solve that gap. So first, let's link external work to internal value. Sorry, I move around a lot, so I don't mean to be <laughs> stepping away from the mic. <laughs> I'm trying to keep still. <laughs> um, so your external clients and partners, they're your rights holders, your governments, investors and buyers. Organizations are expected to do more. Value is no longer corresponds with share price alone, but we are now working towards a common good. We are, looking, we are working towards making this a better planet. Your internal clients are your talent. Millennials and Gen Zs are idealists. They want to know that they work for reputable companies that conduct business in a reputable way. They believe that purposeful work improves the social paradigm and the environment. And by improving social performance, you can attract an invested talent. And those ta that talent will be invested in your success. So that looks like a return on investment of less cost to re uh, recruitment, less cost to retention. They want to help you because you're helping the greater good. So this is how we expect social responsibility to happen. You have government, they, take out, they put out some laws, some regulations, associations should be there as well. They interact with um, indigenous peoples and the miners, and then the service providers are over here somewhere, you know? I'm sure my SGS colleagues are happy that I took out the lab case study. <laughs> um, but service providers are over here that some of them are doing a great job, some of them are not doing such a great job, but there isn't a cohesive, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A collective conscious to get involved with that triangle. So they sit kind of on the outside. But we should make social responsibility happen by working together across the sector. Again, it goes to my point that it's everybody's responsibility. So, one of those questions is, as a service provider and a proponent, when you are adopting this technology, how many people have thought about how this will affect their impact benefit agreement? It's, you don't have to put your hand up. <laughs> not looking to single you out. <laughs> it's just something that you have to think about because your impact benefit agreements are impacted by that, right? And it's not to say that you can't disrupt your mining with your innovation. You absolutely can. 
but you need to find a way to do that so that you are not losing those jobs that, or you're mitigating a loss to those jobs that you've agreed to, that they understand what's going on, how if we are decreasing carbon in our process, which we need to do, which they have an interest in, how are you communicating that to them? Are you doing it with engineering speak? I work in the white space of engineering and social communications, right? So I can, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a geologist, I can speak that language and I can translate that to our communities. My role as go-to-market strategists, especially for the proponents that may think, you know, my, my share price is my market, my role is to say, yeah, but you're also dependent on the communities in which you work. So it's important to be able to translate that information. And there's, you know, social impact, that's what you do. But it's important for social impact and social performance in those functional uh, groups to be embedded within your innovation space and your HR space. So that kind of goes to social innovation design. Has anybody ever heard of this nice little buzzword? Because every university out there is making money off of it. <laughs> so <laughs> social innovation design is looking at these really complex problems and just putting a social lens on it. So again, I was really afraid when I did this presentation that everybody would look at me and say, oh my gosh, she's anti-innovation. I'm not because we know that we need in order to get to net zero, in order to keep all of this, we need to transition to from big oil and hydrocarbons into metals and mining. But it can't be at the risk of what you're doing socially. So social innovation design means looking at a problem holistically and creating a solution that, makes a need, that meets a need while improving social outcomes. So we can't solve an isolated problem like the talent crisis and expect it all to be well. Isolated problem solving results in potentially uncovering more problems. So the result is effective, efficient, and sustainable operations that incorporates a triple bottom line, which is people, planet, and prosperity. You can skip the, you can put the prosperity and put in profits, that's fine. But that's what that means, is that you have to look at all of those pieces, not just your share price. So social well-being, environmental health, the just economy, it's essentially the same thing. So how do we push innovation outside of technology to include our social responsibilities? How do we start to discuss what innovation looks like not just in the technological and digital sphere, but also in the so social sphere. Because it's essentially the same thing. It's two sides of one coin. When I was at CIM this past year, or past year, I was actually speaking to the government, and I spoke with Micah as well, and I asked them that question is how are we, without social responsibility, innovation can only go so far. And it stops, because to Doug's point, your social license to operate is the one thing that's going to slow down projects. So you can't embed technology into a project and think that everything is going to take away your social problem, right? So let's look at Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto has an automated vine. It's fully automated in the Pilbara. I can never remember the name of it. I'm sure you all know what it is. <laughs> but a fully automated iron ore mine with 600 people that work at it once it's completed. 600 people, like that's nothing, right? It decreases on your subs, it decreases on your, um, the people that you need to have on site. So it's great because it's going to be a more environmentally friendly mine, have less carbon impact, but how does that affect your social license to operate? Just a question, something to think about. <laughs> so let's look at the impacts of automation. Problem, we have a de talent deficit. So we've decided that, right? Known, we know this. Baseline scenario according to the Mining Industry Human Resources Council states that 
we have a net employment change that should be as negative beside that 9,600 people in Canada by 2033. And we have a massive amount of jobs to fill at approximately 158,000 in order for us to meet the demand as it currently stands. Solution is we're going to automate. Absolutely, 100% yes. We can go deeper, we can um, operate more safely, we can um, do these amazing projects with these really cool robots, and it's gonna solve our, de our talent deficit. It will, absolutely, but at what cost? So this is the social impact of automation. In Australia, machinery operators and drivers account for 55% of our Indigenous employment. It's pretty significant, right? Automation will remove those rules. We'll hire gamers, perfect. Gamers tend to be white male at a pretty high number, right? So now all of that diversity, equity, inclusion that we've been speaking about is a bit more of a challenge. So in solving that one problem with an isolated solution, we have opened up another problem, right? So that social innovation comes in where you start to think, oh, how am I gonna do this? What am I doing? What is my impact? You know, whatever is my social license to operate. So this is not by means a case study that I worked on. This is just my brain thinking <laughs> in the few minutes that I had. But so how can we automate but increase our social performance? It does require the full sector approach, the approach that I was talking about. It requires all of us to have that input. It requires us to attend conferences where maybe we invite people that don't necessarily agree with what we're doing. And that's okay, right? I know we are in this world where unfortunately it can be pretty dichotomous at times, but diverse thinking provides diverse solutions. So we need to be open to hearing what they have to say. And that's okay. So we have to work with the proponents and the right holders to mitigate the impact and increase the opportunity and increase our productivity, what we're able to mine, how we're able to get there and do it at lower costs. So what if we set up a gaming education program? What if during the project planning process we say, five years, we want to open, we have this project plan, and in five years we want to be fully operational, but we're going to be autonomous. So right now, how about we grab that grade nine kid gaming away someplace and teach her how to drive a vehicle? Participants could include your community and local education facilities. You tap into the high schools. We talk a lot about recruiting early. Recruiting early looks like grade seven, grade eight. Teach them now. I take my 13-year-old daughter to PDAC. Hand to God, she wants to be a driller. I'm like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's teach you how to drill. I took her through the entire process. We went and looked at the drillers. We went and looked at the core logging machines. We talked to the metallurgists. I learned way more about drilling than I ever thought I would. But she now thinks that mining is a really cool career. So let's start attracting them then. Also, let's start to look at those college programs that unfortunately were discontinued, which honestly gutted my heart and soul, and say as an industry, wait a second, don't make that decision. That's a terrible decision. We're already dealing with the talent crisis. Please don't, I will sponsor you. There's definitely business models out there. Cambrian College has Glencore on its, on its buildings, right? So how can we look outside the traditional mining towns that we live and work in and say, where else can we start to provide some more support? Look at Indigenous-owned gaming firms. They, have, they are there, they exist. How cool would it be if a service provider and a major went to an indigenous-owned gaming firm and said, we want you to create a SimCity of mining. Because the SimCity of mining modules exist too. So how can we partner together to get that grade seven, grade eight, grade nine girl into gaming? And then the proponent, right? So they need a deposit to learn on. 
could we give them a retired asset and model that? Valet at Copper Cliff, they've done some really great things with Indigenous and, and community employment. So what they've done is they've decreased the education that's required to drive the trucks because you don't need a college degree to drive a truck and you do not need a license to drive a, a truck on private property. And then they put them on a training deposit so they get real world education. Let's do that in the gaming environment. Oh my gosh, my son would be over the moon. He spends so much time on YouTube watching gaming videos. I do not get it. I'm a, like a zenial. I don't understand, but I'm sure he would be driving a hauler in like no time or, you know, whatever type of automated machinery you want to put underground. And that's how you include diversity, equity, inclusion, indigenous engagement, and solve a problem just like that. Half an hour. <laughs> there you go, my solution to you. <laughs> Take it and go. <laughs> um, but I'm a big fan on, on, on getting young kids into mining. We work in silos because we are taught in silos. It's not their fault. Um, and so how can we look more across the boundaries of education to build better teams? Just like that, I'm done. That was not nice and painless, right? Questions, please? Somebody ask me one. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So Prospector just put out, uh, if anybody follows, follows Prospector, it's an online uh, media. Um, outlet on LinkedIn. They just put out a demographic um, graph last night that showed that senior management in mining, 44% of that are in the ages between 60 and 79. That's a lot, <laughs> right? So yes, we do have a talent issue as far as retirements and natural attrition, absolutely. And that is going to be a massive gut to fill. So part of that means looking outside of the industry and who can we attract? Non-engineer, non-geologist, I'm a communicator. The number of jobs I have been turned down for because I am not an engineer is astounding. But I don't need to be an engineer to build strategic growth plans. I need to understand the value chain. I need to understand the holes, who the target market is, and what your value proposition is. If you can tell me to, to me in a, I don't know, call it grade, oh, let's see, I'm showing my age. I was going to say grade 13. They don't even have that anymore, grade 12 <laughs> level. I can probably figure out where you need to go to grow and then show the return on investment. So we need to be more willing to accept different backgrounds as well as so between that and developing the automation we can start to level the playing fields and we also need to this is a whole nother discussion that i can talk to for hours about we also need to make sure our people feel like they belong that's really important this is a very diverse crowd i was so excited when i was like taking pictures i hope that you feel like you belong in this sector i want you to feel like you belong in this sector that's really important Doug's going to tell me to go. So just then this. Okay, final thoughts. <laughs> Innovation and social responsibility require cross-sector approach and pairing of social performance with technology advances. When we co-create, we develop a better, more resilient sector. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>